perhaps. Okay, now to you guys. Um, I met Eric two and a half years ago at Harold Eberle's conference, and it was also my first exposure to, uh, I, I'd seen uh, you post some on Facebook and stuff like that, but you got up in the snap talks, the 20 minute snap talks, and Eric scared me. You were so enthusiastic, and you were so passionate. And I was going, I'm going to go talk later, and I'm going to stand there, and everybody's going to fall asleep. And it, it wasn't even a comparative thing. You were so passionate about that. And then Vicki talked to me. She was in your class, and she talked to me about hope, and it made so much sense. And then in the last couple of years, I've got to know you a little better. And if you like candy that's crunchy on the outside and soft and gooey on the inside, that's Eric. <laughs> <laughs> That's Eric. So uh, anyway, I just commend him and this concept of hope to you guys, and I turn these guys over to you. Awesome. Good. Can everyone hear me all right? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Good, good, good. This is amazing. It's so fantastic to uh, be with you guys, connect with you guys, and to do it from the comforts of my own office. What a what a concept, right? Uh, so... Uh, I am so thankful that Larry and Vicky connected and have invited us in. It's such a blessing. And I love the fact that we get to be a part of new pioneering. That's the way um, the core part of me, breaking ground, pioneering, moving into different things. And you guys are uh, stepping forward, moving forward, advancing. And what's available to us uh, individually, as businesses, as homes, and then even as ministry, be able to connect broadly and connect globally right from where we are. So it's amazing to think that, um, you know, in the past it seemed like if there was going to be a large global footprint, if you will, from a ministry, it required you to be within the thousand. Uh, to be able to accomplish that and to do that. But now you can literally, well, you can be an individual for, uh, for all that is, right? But it only takes a handful of us to work together, partner together like you guys are, and you begin to have a global footprint, a global influence, and an impact that is well beyond the room that you're seeing. And what a powerful uh, opportunity. So I commend you for making the choices, uh, making the effort, Going through the um, going through the sketching, going through the learning curve, going through everything that it takes to get tech savvy enough to make this happen, to do it with quality like you guys are doing, and to allow this to be a vehicle in which the goodness of Father gets to be communicated and the reality of the beauty of our sonship and our nautilhood that gets to be, if you will, broadcast around the earth in a very um, uh, tangible and very personal, connected way. Because as I was engaged with you in worship, as if I was there. So, how cool is that? But, uh, anyways, um, let me give just maybe a brief uh, introduction uh, of myself and what I'm up to. Eric? And, yes, sir. We're having a little bit of a cutout on your audio. So, uh, did right. you happen? Did you happen to get those those uh, headsets? You know, I didn't. Uh, I only have ones with the new lightning. Oh, okay. IPhone. That's okay. No worries. W what you can do, it'll be a little more work for you, but if you can mute your audio while you're talking to us and then just turn it back on when somebody has a question, I think that might solve the problem. Mute? Okay. Um, mute your, not your, not your audio. Mute your, your, uh, speakers. your speakers on your computer. Yeah, okay. One second. Let me try. Here we go. Okay. Does that help any? Yeah. I think talk some. Okay, I can't hear any responses. Um, it's I know it's better, but when we'll we'll come up here to the mic. When you see us, just turn it back on. Okay, that's so, helping a lot. And the people on Zoom. All right, good deal. Yeah, well, uh, I still a final thing. I can uh, I can talk to an empty room by myself. <laughs> no um, but anyways, as I was saying, Trish, you could hear through some of that. I was I was having um, echo feedback as well. So if this helps them perfect but thanks again for going through the stretching going through the learning curve of making this kind of thing happen because if you're able to do that uh you guys are already ahead of the curve in a lot of ways which is powerful so um anyways thanks again to larry and vicky for connecting this 
the work that went behind setting this up, the work to get a ball quarter of our book, Hope Equals Ball, to get it into your hands. Trusted uh, those of you who are able to have it already are being blessed by it, being strengthened and encouraged by it. Uh, hopefully even make, being challenged by it. That's obviously uh, part of the uh, uh, part of the aim as well. And if you haven't got a copy, I'm glad that there's still maybe a few copies uh, there for you to get a hold of and um, utilize, uh, which will be uh, totally awesome. So um, thanks for all the behind the scenes work, Larry. Appreciate uh, getting all that uh, put together. But um, again, maybe just in a little, little way of introduction so you guys can know a little bit about me because I perceive this to be um, a long-term connection together that's something uh, much more than just one Zoom um, Zoom meeting together. I have totally enjoyed uh, meeting Larry and Vicki. I remember uh, that uh, theological roundtable Larry, where we were first in a room together uh, out at Gerald's and there's six hours of, of intense engagement over theology. And I kept finding myself listening to your questions, your responses, your input. You were sitting right down the table from me uh, to my right. Uh, and I remember uh, listening to you uh, share, dialogue, all of the above. And with, uh, I just kept thinking, man, I really enjoy what I'm hearing this gentleman uh, communicate, speak about, share the questions that were being asked. Uh, and maybe even one of the things that's been most, um, that I've most enjoyed since connecting with uh, Larry, not only the revelation or the insights that he carries, but really the tone, the heart, the nature in which he communicates it in and releases it. It really puts the emphasis behind the revelation because what's revelation without being, uh, without it being tangible? And Larry uh, makes it tangible in the way that he communicates and shares what he exudes from him. Uh, is awesome. So it's been amazing, and uh, it was a fun time uh, speaking in the conference in one of the 20-minute um, uh, Snapchats, I think they call it, uh, something like that. Um, and uh, it's always a great time to do that. Maybe I'm looking to get there in 20, uh, this year as well for 2019, but we'll see. Um, nonetheless, I think to connect over in Pennsylvania. Thanks for making a long journey across the country uh, to connect over in Chambersburg. We've uh, got to hang out now. We've even sat down at Red Robin together and took on the bowl of endless fries, right? So, um, which matter of fact, on that note, important things you guys need to know that, uh, that Colorado was the first place I ever had Red Robin. It would have been a long time ago in 1999. My wife and I lived in Denver, actually there in the southeast area of Aurora. Um, and uh, Red Robin literally was on the corner uh, of the road um, that our apartment was on. And so uh, that's the first time we ever had Red Robin. So Colorado keeps me connected. <laughs> um, so we did, we've been to Colorado Springs. Uh, we love your city, love your area. Obviously who can't, uh, who wouldn't enjoy the beauty of what's around you guys. We've been to Red Rocks, the Garden of the Gods, uh, been to the top of Pikes Peak. Matter of fact, I think I went at the end of June, if I remember right, somewhere in the middle of June, maybe. And uh, we started off at the bottom in shorts and t-shirts. And by the time we got to the top was in a snowy blizzard. Um, and luckily for some reason, we had winter coats in the trunk of our car. I'm not for sure why, but it paid off that day. So I've been to the top of the mountain, but couldn't see anything, right? The storm was such that um, wasn't much visibility in that, but it was fun uh, to be there. Uh, I've also been there a couple of times uh, for some conferences, uh, Dutch Sheets, who um, I believe uh, maybe many of you would know uh, is a friend of mine and um, connected with things that he's done in the city there. I think it used to be Harvest Church. I think they've renamed it uh, now under Jay Duncan's leadership, which uh, he and I uh, have connected and done stuff together uh, over the years, and uh, which has been awesome. I've also been in some meetings at the, I believe it's the Focus on the Family uh, building with the Lighthouse Movement. Um, they had me in some of their uh, leadership, um, some of their leadership meetings, board meetings, whatever it was called, concerning the heartbeat of our first book called Generational Synergy, which was the passion uh, that we see in the heart of God, the nature of God, and also expressed through scripture that the design of God and his kingdom is to have the generations running as one versus running away from each other, right? And so uh, we communicated that across the, really even across the world, um, for, for now quite a long time, 15 years or so almost at this point, 
and um, have uh, loved the opportunity to do that. So some of those organizations wanted us to communicate into their uh, strategies on how to bring generations together so that we have a fuller force if you will, of the movement of the kingdom happening in the earth. So uh, anyways, a little update on how I've got to connect in your city um, over the years, which has been awesome, and now getting to do it again. So, and I'm sure at some point uh, I'll need to find, uh, we'll find a way for my feet to be on the ground again with you guys in person, and I'll eat the pizza with you, right? So um, anyways, uh, so that's a little bit of background history with that. Angela and I, my wife, we've been married, uh, headed on 22 years um, this year, and we have done uh, all of our time together, has been in leadership and ministry and business more recently, and uh, loving uh, life together. Four children, Ezekiel and Nehemiah, our first two, our sons, uh, 14 and 11, and we have two daughters, uh, Elizabeth and Liberty, who are eight and five. So they're all here in the house with me as well as today. So if at any point there becomes any kind of noise from the background, uh, they're out there doing doing their thing, right? And so, hey, thanks for scanning the room too. It's cool to see everybody uh, in the room there. Um, everybody wave at me and I'll know you're, hey, look at that, nice. Um, so um, so we have, we have been in leadership uh, in ministry uh, myself, uh, really, which seems crazy, uh, towards 25 years at this point, I started uh, leading and ministering as a teenager uh, in public school, started a hardcore heavy metal band as a teenager that uh, traveled the country, toured, wrote music, uh, recorded stuff, who's uh, the band actually is still going on and is still one of the still predominant leading uh, bands of that genre. Uh, we are breaking ground, breaking uh, an entirely new genre of uh, of, he of heavy metal music at that point uh, in the mid '90s, um, and so did that as a ministry venue and avenue that opened doors for us to go into some really dark places and be some light and salt uh, in those situations, which was a blast. And then um, was hired as a youth pastor when I was 19 on staff with a church in Ohio. And did that, and then it was out of out of that season. We moved to Denver, Colorado, um, and was a part of what's now the Potter's House uh, in Aurora. It was called Heritage Christian Center. Previous to that, it was led by Dennis Leonard, and um, was there working with the generations at that point, uh, and so forth. Moved from there to Tampa, Florida, to plant a congregation uh, with a gentleman, and did that for a few years, and then back to our hometown area in Southeast Ohio, where we've been since uh, uh, 20 or 2003. And uh, anyway, so uh, we've, we've worked with and planted multiple churches and then uh, been on staff with multiple churches, uh, certainly uh, spoke all over the country, traveled, written books. I've started a second hardcore metal band 20 years after uh, being done with the first one. Uh, we're not so active at this moment, kind of on a little break, but um, I wasn't even for sure I could do such a thing in my 40s. Uh, and by the way, it's real different than being a teenager. So uh, nonetheless, that's been fun. And so here we are um, together today uh, after writing our second book, Hope Equals Bold. And I'm extremely excited for the third book that I'm working currently working on and uh, nearly done with that's going to be a very forward, very bold uh, book that's um, I'm trusting will both shake up the Christian world as well as engage in and intrigue uh, those that are maybe have not yet looked at Christ uh, and looked at the reality that we have in him. So looking forward to that being uh, done this year, released um, and out there uh, making a difference. Um, we've also started, uh, I've personally started a new business called Bold Success Global Ventures. That's a personal development company and success movement for those who want to learn to live from success rather than chasing it. We're unleashing the success of people who are done with the upside down system of living based on what you do and helping you move into the greater reality of living from who you are. Uh, and this is absolutely impacting people, unlocking people as I'm providing personal, um, personal development coaching 
uh, getting ready to release new online success environments that will be an opportunity for people to be able to gain from me and other top hope leaders that I've assembled from around the country that will be speaking um, and releasing uh, continual and constant content into that online community. Uh, as well, of course, we continue to do events and keynotes and are even setting up now what we're calling success hubs, which are opportunities basically of doing somewhat what we're doing right now. We have one that's uh, now started in Delaware and uh, looking at uh, planning one in Long Island, New York, over near Chicago. And I just reached out this week to a team of uh, leaders that I'm connected with in South Africa to look at um, basically planting and developing what we're calling success hubs, which is essentially uh, the concept of uh, people getting together in a living room or a business office uh, or in a coffee shop, wherever the case may be, where you can connect. And then we're simply utilizing Zoom like you guys are, and I'm Zooming into those gatherings uh, to teach and to uh, pour in the revelation of Father's goodness, the present, uh, what I call present reality thinking that is based off of the present reality of hope uh, and pouring that into those um, communities uh, and those um, uh, in a way that is unlocking the success of who you are. Because at some point, uh, this isn't where I'm going all the way this morning, but I can't help but to say it in this moment. At some point, we have to leave the concept of chasing success and begin to live from success. And what I will talk about today uh, will add into uh, or will be the somewhat of the foundation of where uh, I've developed that concept that we already are a full success because you can't get more of a success than being a son or daughter. There is no higher rung for you to climb. There is no uh, more ascended place, if you will, than, city, than, than being seated in the heavenly realms uh, with Christ and in Christ. There's no higher ground for us to, uh, to achieve or to go into. We cannot be more of a success than we already are. And so our time uh, living becomes the opportunity to live from that success, seeing it materialized and be released into all that our life does. And so the achievements that we um, step into and the uh, things that we accomplish in our life is and should be the outflow and the reflection of the success of who we are, not our attempt to be quote to quote become some kind of a success. And this is a complete uh, reversal again of the upside down system that I mentioned a minute ago that has basically trained us now for centuries that our success is based off of what we do rather than who we are. And at some point we are going to see a significant shift to live out of an identity based existence instead of a performance based existence. And whenever Christianity gets itself uh, revolutionized and gets itself reformed to where we become the trumpeting voice uh, leading the way to say we are not designed to live off of performance, but we're designed to live our best out of our identity. And that becomes the requirement of each and every one of us, one, to make the adjustments in the mindsets that we need to live from and then become the influencers and the impactors and the disruptors within a culture and systems that's set up and designed to be based off of what you do and your performance instead of based off of who you are in your identity. And so I intend to be part of leading the way in that. I intend to be part of shaping those kind of mindsets, shaping that kind of understanding and literally training and coaching and developing both people, leaders, individuals and organizations, both business and nonprofit in a way that will increasingly see the leaven of that revelation filling the earth so that we move people more uh, more uh, move people further into actualizing their potential, which is what glory is. Glory is not some mystical idea of floating around or some kind of um, kind of, some kind of ethereal feeling or a goose bump uh, or even a, a cloud uh, forming within a meeting or gold dust falling from it. I'm down with all of that. I'll take all the gold that wants to fall in my life. That's totally fine. But that simply is manifestations of things, not 
actual glory. Glory is actualized potential. I don't have time to get into all of that today, but when you are living, uh, uh, living your potential and moving further in your potential, you are moving in glory. The earth is filled with the glory of God. In other words, it's filled with potential that is to be actualized by the success of sons and daughters digging into that potential and bringing, if you will, that desert-like situation into gar into a garden. And so in that, we are going to bring increased glory in the earth by actualizing people's potential so that the goodness of God is revealed and so that it benefits uh, so that it benefits uh, all the people of the earth. And so anyways, I'm kind of rambling in that regard. You get me wound up. I wasn't even really what I was going for. I just want to let you know a little bit of my heart, where I am, what I'm doing and what I'm after and extremely excited to partner with you guys uh, in this. So um, if I can, uh, let me transition for a few minutes and just talk a little bit out of hope equals bold. Uh, and then of course, we'll take that break um, and uh, get some food and then we can do some Q&A for those that are able to hang around for that, which I'm extremely excited for. And I'll call it uh, Q&R because it'll probably uh, most likely be more responses than just answers. Um, but um, we'll look at that. So uh, I had to I had to get one a, a copy of, of my book myself. Sometimes I ought to go back and read my own book. There's some pretty good stuff in here, right? Um, but I was looking at really uh, was out of, uh, this might be kind of, kind of different, but it's where, what captured my heart was actually out of the dedication uh, portion of the book that says that this book, uh, it's for you. Uh, it's for the hearts ready to embrace something for now, instead of putting it off until later. And that just jumped back out at me because my passion and my heartbeat is to get us to find ourselves living from instead of trying to get to. And there's a whole lot to talk about in that, and we can do some more sessions maybe to, to train some more on this, but it's uh, uh, there's a real easy uh, example that we can use when, if I had a whiteboard um, here with me. I'm trying to see if there would be a way I could draw it uh, with something. Um, perhaps uh, let me try to do this. I didn't think about this ahead of time or I would have already done it. Um, most of you, if you've had any kind of teaching, I don't know if I can get um, this little this little diagram um, is basically a diagram of the temple system uh, where the outer court, the inner court, Holy of Holies uh, was laid out and designed. And that system was a system that had mankind set up on the outside of that system instead of the heartbeat and the revelation of God that has always had us on the inside. If I can say it like this, guys, there's never been a time that humanity, you or anyone else, has ever been out of the heart of God. You, you, there's never been a time where you were not in the heart of God. And so the system that was set up under Moses was a, yes, come on, I can't hear you, but I see you cheering. Come on. Uh, uh, set, uh, the system that was set up under Moses brought, brought this concept to man that we were on the outside and had to do all of these things in order to get ourselves on the inside. But Christ came to be the revelation that we are not on the outside, but we are those who are totally on the inside, and that is where we are. And so we're not out here trying to get in. We are in here that is releasing that outward because we have the same opportunity to show that kind of diagram. It's amazing how God set up so much symmetry in, uh, in the world in creation. This is a really bad doodle, and sorry for my artwork on this, but this bottom one is the same kind of diagram that shows us the Garden of Eden, Eden, and the rest of the world. Because all of Eden was not a garden, but there was a garden within Eden, and that's where we're told that God and man were one with each other. And out of that, where uh, the picture is given in Genesis of being four rivers that were flowing out of Eden and out of through that garden. In other words, what was going on in that garden was designed to be exported out 
into all of the uh, all of the world and all of the earth. It was to be the leaven that would leaven the entire lump. And so it was always the nature and heartbeat of God and the design of God that mankind and God would be one together in this garden-like situation because in our awareness and connectivity and relationship with God is where we flourish like a garden instead of living in the thorns and thistles of a desert-like experience that is not connected and in relationship with Father. And so those rivers were showing us that we're to be, uh, that what is going on in our relationship and connectivity with God is to be an outflow into the desert-like situation, the barren areas, or even the unactualized potential that is out in the world. And that flow was to see those garden-like experiences begin to flourish and become gardenized all the way out of the garden, into Eden, and into the outermost parts of the earth. And doesn't that sound just like Acts chapter one, right? And so the heartbeat of God has been continually moving us to realize we are not outside trying to get in. We are actually inside and supposed to be allowing that to flow out. And so because the system that was under Moses set up the mindset of mankind that we're outside trying to get in, unfortunately, too much of Christianity has furthered uh, and uh, furthered that concept because somehow it's been perceived that what Christ did is something that's been layered on top of what was going on under Moses. And I have to say it like this, the new, better, superior covenant that we are in is not Judaism 2.0. We are not in an updated system of Judaism. We are in something entirely different, entirely other, based on better promises, based on better situation, superior to what was. And so in my estimation, one of the greatest downfalls and uh, hurdles that we have for the advancement of the heartbeat of God through Christianity is that we've embraced the idea of Judeo-Christianity. And somewhat that's been formulized, especially for America, because of our American culture that has said we have established and built a nation based on Judeo-Christian principles. And the reality is, is Jesus did not build a Judeo-Christianity. Jesus set up a Jesus Christianity. And Jesus Christianity is not Judaism with Christ with the cross attached to it. Jesus Christianity is an entirely different situation that is the revelation of what the heart of father has always been and so until you and i and the generations to come unwind ourselves from the idea that uh the idea of what was set up through the temple system then we're going to continue to participate in the ideas of the temple system which is that we are outside somewhere trying to get somewhere and I'm trying to say to us, we don't have anywhere to get to. We are already in. We're not looking to arrive somewhere. We're looking to become aware of what we're already in and see that become the outflow of how we do life, which is the essential message of what I am bringing when it comes to the concept of biblical hope, the place of what we have not the place of what we're trying to get. Hope is not about the future. Hope is the revelation of what we have. Hope isn't somewhere off in the distance. Hope is here. It's right now. It's what you have. It's what I have. It's what's available to everyone. We're not in a place where we have to perceive that we're waiting for the goodness of Father. We already have the goodness of father we don't have to perceive that we're waiting on there to be some kind of better existence we have we are in a better existence that can materialize in all of our situations that is the unconditional assurance of father's goodness prevailing in our life and so you and i have to become those who make these um uh, mindsets adjustment to become renewed in our thinking, renewed in our mind, uh, ultimately becoming rewired literally in our brain. Every time you learn something new, are you aware that you literally get a new brain? 
Every time you learn something new, a new a, a new electrical impulse wiring establishes itself in your brain. Therefore, you literally have a new brain. You have a new wire. If you learn something uh, different than what your wiring already was, you're breaking that wiring and rewiring it to a new understanding. That means you literally have a new mind, a new brain. And that's what we've got to keep moving into so that we begin to function in a different way. And so there's a whole lot for that I want to keep going in on that, but uh, I thought I would uh, maybe highlight um, uh, out of hope equals bold, I thought I would highlight uh, day five um, kind of in regard to this talk this morning uh, that is titled Old Ways, Old Results. And so if we don't get uh, these this rewiring in our mind, if we don't get this renewing of our mind, it's how we are literally trans form the word there actually would even be more importantly to understand as transfigured that uh, the metamorpho i believe is how you pronounce the word there is more appropriately attached to transfigured meaning caterpillar to butterfly not just something not just a better version of a caterpillar moving completely from caterpillar to butterfly those are two entirely different situations. And so that by the renewing of our mind and our thinking and our mindsets is how we go from a butterfly or from a caterpillar to a butterfly. We're not looking to just become a better version of a caterpillar. And if you can hear me say it this way, in Christ, we are already the butterfly and we have to renew our mind to the revelation that we're the butterfly. We're not a caterpillar still trying to get there. Ooh, if this becomes the situation that we are able to realign ourselves to, you actually get to go live being the butterfly instead of perceiving yourself as a caterpillar still trying to get there. And if, and if that becomes the reality of the way that the majority of Christianity begins to walk in the earth, look out, the glory of God is going to manifest itself at accelerated, deeper, further, uh, 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 further reaches than ever before. And it will be for the glory and honor of God and the benefit of others. It'll be a powerful deal. And so looking at old ways, um, create old results uh, in this um, in this daily uh, chapter study that I gave in there I utilized uh, we've already talked a little bit about the temple system but I utilized what was going on with Israel uh, when they're coming out of Egypt to communicate this idea and it was it's the concept that you can you can move into different situations but if you don't renew your mind you are still going to reproduce the same results. And so the children of Israel, as we know, with, that were uh, in bondage and captivity of slavery uh, to Pharaoh and his system in Egypt for what we're told four centuries, 400 years. Uh, could you imagine? America has, has barely uh, existed just over, uh, just over half of that. So could you imagine uh, how entrenched the American mindset is right now? Could you imagine doubling the time for a mindset to develop. That's what was going on with Israel. 400 years of slavery under Pharaoh. And an important part to make sure that you would understand then that Pharaoh in that time, this is a little challenging for us as Americans uh, to understand this. Pharaoh was not even considered a king. Pharaoh was considered a deity, a god. So in other words, there was 400 years, four centuries of Israel being trained in the mindset that this, this Pharaoh is God. In other words, Pharaoh is what God is like. And so 400 years of that, not owning anything, not having their own name, not having their own property, not having the ability to choose, not having the ability to go uh, sit down and do nothing for the day without having harsh, punishing repayment or perhaps even death itself and so certainly you would know the story about how even in that time frame at a certain point pharaoh even began to take away their raw materials but yet demand increased production 
<laughs> well, that's a that's a pretty rough situation. And if if they didn't live up to meeting the quotas every day, then they were going to be beaten. Uh, they were going to be uh, obviously treated horribly. Probably many even died harshly, harshly handled and treated because they didn't measure up to the demands of God, the demands of Pharaoh. And so this was the mindset that was trained for generation after generation after generation after generation. You do this and do it well and do it as I say, or you will be punished. That was the system that four centuries worth of, of Israelites lived under. I hate how much it sounds very similar to the, to the predominant mainstream teaching of Christianity now for multiple centuries itself. Where, I mean, we're even down the road 500 years. We've got an additional century since the uh, the, the uh, Protestant Reformation where we've got 500 years of some of these entrenched ideas that we're working through and working past uh, and trying to get beyond. But if you can imagine 400 years without Internet, without Facebook, without the written word, with I mean, without any uh, written word, meaning books, literature, anything— the Israelites, can you imagine how slow any kind of new mindset would be to even develop? It'd be crazy. We're able to move much quicker today because we're able to do these things like we're doing right now, uh, even without overhead. Can you imagine? We didn't have to pay for, for plane flights for me to be there, hotels to be there. All of that gets to be uh, wrapped into a situation now to expand the kingdom instead of just travel, right? That's just a little side note and how cool this is. Um, but anyways, Israel, 400 years, is in the place of that's the only way they understand God and the only way they understand themselves. They only understand that my, my existence is based on what I do. My existence is based on what I produce. My existence is based on what I bring forth or how much I accomplish. And I can only be perceived of having worth or having value by the amount that I produce or what I achieve. And if I don't achieve enough, my value and my worth is so little that it's okay to beat me with a leather whip. It's okay to throw rocks and stones at me. It's okay to punch me in the face and spit on me and call me names. It's okay to literally abuse me at the depth of abuse that was going on if I do not produce well or do not produce enough. And so the mindset becomes that my life only exists to produce. The only value, the only worth that I have is if I'm achieving something that is what somebody else wants. That's the system that was in play. And that, uh, I would dare to even say that's still the dominant system that humanity lives under, both within Christianity and both outside of Christianity, uh, is the predominant mindset that you are only worth what you're capable of producing. And so we continue to reinforce a Pharaoh system that says we will punish you if you don't produce what we want you to produce. And then we project that concept on the father of Jesus Christ. We, pro we project that concept onto the nature of God, which is absolutely the opposite of what Jesus reveals to us about the nature of God. And so if we continue to move in those old mindsets in those old kind of ways, we will keep producing the same old results, which means us living under the torment and the torture and the stress and the condemnation and the fear that controls most of our lives. But the place of freedom in that is to move out of that system in our minds and move into Jesus in the understanding of spirit where there is liberty. When we're able to leave a system of death and a system of condemnation and move into the reality of spirit for where the spirit is, there is freedom. There is liberty, which leads me to the paramount uh, chapter, if you will, and the paramount verse in which I've developed this concept of hope around, which is 2 Corinthians chapter 3, the whole chapter, and then specifically 
verse 12, for we have this hope, so we're very bold. Hope is what we have. It's not something we're looking to obtain. It's not something that we need to wait on. That's why scripture tells us elsewhere that hope deferred makes the heart sick. The word deferred means to put off till later. We all know this easily if we just even think about next week being the Super Bowl. And at the beginning of the game, they'll flip a coin, right, to see who gets the ball first. And usually whoever wins that coin toss does what with that choice? They defer it. They put it off to the second half. And so when scripture tells us that hope that's put off till later is what makes the human soul sick. When we don't embrace the reality of what we have, we live in a place of lack, of scarcity, of longing, of waiting, and that's not what the design of who we are was made to thrive in. We live in survival mode instead of thriving mode, and that is what begins to lower our actualizing of our potential. When we live from survival, we're not interested in releasing our potential. We're only interested in trying to make it today. But when we live in the mindsets of thriving, then we are able to look at, okay, what do I actualize today? What do I bring forth more out of me today? What do I have to offer to the world today? How can I shape my family to a further revelation of my success today? How can I produce more income? How do I solve more problems? How many more businesses can I create? How many more people can I reach? What more impact can be released in the earth? Where do I need to go around the world to release the glory of God into? We live in those kind of modes when we're living in thriving mindsets instead of survival mindsets. And so what I want us to see out of 2 Corinthians 3, and maybe I'll kind of wrap it up and uh, you guys can Uh, we can move on with what we need to do for the rest of our time together. Um, When we look at 2 Corinthians 3, I think a very key old mindset that we need to do away with that I felt like I needed to to give to you guys today. Uh, Let me get a drink of my lemon water. What uh, What I wanted to bring to you guys to consider today, and if you're open to a new mindset, and if you're open to change, and if you're open to living from your success instead of spending the rest of your life chasing it, if you're open to go with things in a new way, open to new understanding, if you're open to getting out of old mindsets so you can get into new results, if you're open to that, then I want to say to you that 2 Corinthians 3 shows us an old glory and a new glory. 2 Corinthians 3 lays out two different glories. We're told the glory of the former, the glory of the ministry of death, the ministry of condemnation, the covenant of condemnation came with a certain measure of glory. So much so that they had to put a veil over Moses's face so that it, uh, so that as they looked at it, they could still interact with him. The crazy thing is, is that glory that came with the former, the glory that came under Moses was a fading glory. It was a glory that the moment at Sinai was its zenith. And from there it declined because that glory always had an expiration date. It was not an everlasting covenant or an everlasting glory. It had it had an expiration date to it. It was going to come to an end. In other words, it's like that package of hamburger in your refrigerator. After this time, (laughs) you don't want to get into that or it's going to be pretty rough on you. And so this glory under Moses, the the ministry of death, the covenant of condemnation had a glory that was fading. And it was really the veil over Moses's face really remained on his face in order for the people to not see the glory dimming or the glory fading. But it was out of that that Christ came and brought forth and brought forth the revelation of the everlasting covenant, the superior one, the one that Father has always been working in and functioning in. It was not a new covenant to God. It's the way he's always been. 
It's a new covenant to our understanding. It's a new covenant to our experience. It's a new covenant to our interaction with God, not his interaction with us. And so when we see this, we understand that 2 Corinthians 3 goes on to tell us that we are those who can experience and know and interact with Father with unveiled faces. In other words, without distortion of this veil, without um, without a hindrance of knowing what he's really like, without uh, being able to see him uh, dimly. We are now those who can see him in the full light of Jesus without the veil, for it was the ministry of death and the covenant of condemnation. In other words, the temple system under Moses and the law order under Moses that veiled our understanding of what father was really like. And it's actually in second Corinthians three says when it's taught, it still hardens the hearts of man into a heart of stone, if you will, instead of into the heart of flesh in which Christ brings us. And so it's out of that with this unveiled face that we behold his glory. In other words, we behold even the potential now that this, what this means, that God isn't like what we saw under Moses, that God isn't like Pharaoh, that God isn't like Baal or Molech. God isn't like that. God is like Jesus. And when we see that, the potential that that unlocks in the earth is unbelievable. We haven't even perceived yet what's available when we step into that place and that understanding. And it's from that place of freedom and liberty to go for it, liberty to go for more, freedom to um, to be open to better, freedom to go after the potential that you have. It's in that liberty. It's in that freedom that we recognize we have been moved from glory to glory. Here's the, here's the old mindset that I want to invite you to let go of. 2 Corinthians 3 is putting two glories against each other. So we moved from this glory under the covenant of death into the greater glory, the everlasting glory of the freedom in spirit. I'm only saying this because a whole lot of Christianity has utilized that verse from glory to glory to create within us the mindset that we are somewhere at a lower position and we're moving to higher positions, usually connected to the idea if we perform better and if we do more and that we produce more, we'll be moving from some lower form of glory to a higher level of glory. In other words, a whole lot of Christianity has taught a very pagan system idea of moving to higher elevations of existence, when in reality, we are already set in the highest level of existence, which is in Christ, seated in the heart of God. We can't get any higher than we already are. So it was not the idea of being moved, uh, that we're moving from a lower form of glory to a higher form of glory within our Christ experience. It's that we are moved from the lesser glory of the old covenant into the full glory of the new covenant. And once there, there is no higher place to go. You are at the top. You are at the highest zenith point as a son and a daughter. And your existence now is to be from the ascended place, not trying to keep climbing up the glory ladder that if we can do more and be more and produce more and give more and sing more and pray more and do this more and do this more and do this more, maybe we can achieve some high level of glory by the time our body quits working. <laughs> and then we can understand that we're actually living from heaven into earth instead of living in earth trying to get into heaven. If this becomes the revelation to which we let go of these old ideas and step into these uh, to the understanding of present reality thinking, then we begin to produce an entirely different kind of existence and experience, and we step into actualizing the potential of who we are individually, who we are as a family, 
who we are in our businesses or our entrepreneurial work, who we are as a ministry, as a community, as a body of those who are connected together to bring forth newness. We get to actually actualize increased measures of that when we stop spending our energy, our creativity, stop spending our time, stop spending our focus, stop spending our opportunities on trying to figure out how we get to some better experience of glory and realize you're already in the highest point of glory. And now you get to release that into what you do in your life, through your life, so that it is honoring to God and beneficial to others. This boom, becomes what it's like to live bold. This is what it becomes like to live your bold success. This is what it becomes like to live from what hope unlocks. Hope unlocks boldness. Hope equals bold. It brings you into an unconditional assurance. Father's goodness prevails so you can be bold enough to step into the truest you, go for what it is you want in this world, and give all that you can so that God is honored and others are benefited. So I'm looking for those who's open to some mindset changes, some mindset shifts. I'm looking for those who's ready to embrace the fact that you are already in instead of out and that you're already ascended and not beneath. And that you're already in the apex zenith of glory, seated in Christ, already in heaven, unlocking that in the earth. Those who are ready to move out of old patterns in old ways so that you quit producing old results and step into new ways and new patterns so that you bring uh, new ways and new mindsets. So you bring forth new patterns of your life, new patterns in relationships, new patterns in your finances new patterns in your impact, new patterns in your influence, new patterns of your creativity and your problem solving, new patterns of interacting and connecting and causing people to go forward. That's what sons and daughters do. Sons and daughters aren't sitting around in a system trying to build bricks and to get enough bricks made every day so that you don't get punished. Sons and daughters are at the table sitting enjoying taking in the heart of father so that you can let the outflow of that garden experience expand and be exported into all the desert like barren places that you interact with so that because you are involved that thing which is barren and thorn and thistles becomes gardenized that's what you're here for that's what's going on that's why Joyland exists. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm doing bold success. That's why we're doing what we do. That's why I wrote Hope Equals Bold. It's what we're seeing ourselves move into. And we're going to do it at higher and higher and fuller capacities. We're going to reveal and release the full glory that we're in in fuller measures. When we live from success, instead of spinning our wheels in a rat race, trying to chase it, all right? How's that sound, guys? I'll, I'll hit an unmute and we can go from there. Oh my gosh. Are we in here? Okay, that was perfect. That was amazing. Can you hear? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, we got a, a minute for a couple of questions here in general. And so I'd like to defer to somebody who for various reasons can't stay and ask them more directly. Is there anybody here? First of all, can we give Eric something? Like a hand or a cheer or something? <laughs> and, and you see that as, as he got wound up a little bit, that crunchy part came out. And that was good. <laughs> that was real good. Get that, Larry. Crunchy on the outside. <laughs> anyway, uh, some of the stuff that we've been talking about or that I've been talking to you about, about trying to find our voice, this is, this is right in the core of the wheelhouse of that. Um, and, and, but I think that I even fell prey, Eric, I fell prey to not a doctrine of separation, but a, but a, uh, a progression idea as opposed right. to a shake off these false perspectives, s stand where you are. And I was reminded at the end when you were saying, 
So often that, that scripture is misquoted that the glory of the Lord is going to cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. No, it's not. It's the knowledge of the glory. The glory is already here. It's a finished thing now. He's redeemed. We were talking about that last week. So God did a whole bunch of stuff without our permission, but he can't change our minds without our agreement. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So any questions? Anybody wants to just one or two or any comment you want to make before we make a break? Zoom, zoom. Yeah, Zoomers, you guys got any questions? Nope, nope, nope. nope. Uh, anybody? Yeah. Hi, Eric. Hi, Eric. My name's Krista. Um, hi, Krista. Hi. So probably one of the biggest things that impacted me in reading your book was just the perspective change of actually beholding the Father that changes our whole perspective. So you become what you're beholding. And that then I just... Behold the Father, and then I see things the way that he does, and that's what I want. Um, so I really appreciate that. But I am curious, to in the back of your book, you talk about how you and your family live and make bold choices. It's in your bio. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you, you out of the all. whole, what's that? You read everything. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I know. So the whole book, my question is just if you have any examples of what that means for you and your family in practical ways of how you're choosing to live boldly based on just living out of hope. Yeah, awesome. Great question. Let me hit, um, let me hit my mute here, and then I can talk to you better. Um, uh, yeah, thanks again. A, a great question. I think when I when I wrote that in, in the little bio there, um, when, when I think about the reader family, um, we just tend to go at things a little bit outside the mainstream, meaning we just, we're not that conventional. Um, I'm personally not that con uh, conventional of a person. And so we, uh, I've just never had a real nature of going with the flow of the mainstream. Uh, and so maybe we are that way a little bit as a family. And I don't mean to say like we're some, some weirdos or living on planet Mars or something in probably a lot of ways we're probably, um, you know, would just be relatable uh, to any other family context. But this, but what I'm meaning in that, we we have predominantly chose to focus on us, meaning Angela and I, determining the course of our family, determining what we do with our children, how we do things with our children, and what we want our children to obtain. And maybe any parent would have that, but we've also just chose to not participate with the demands that um, a culture sets uh, on families. And so uh, in that, we, we, um, we've made choices to homeschool our children, uh, not to exclude or separate, but because we can put in them what will better serve their life than uh, what we perceive a government system can do. And so uh, we do that. We involve our children. The whole generational synergy thing is a very big part uh, of how we do life and do family. Uh, I don't know if you guys, you, uh, hopefully maybe you guys didn't see this, but while I started uh, in this talk today, my oldest son came in with my um, phone uh, and a um, iPhone gimbal and was filming me from behind the scenes uh, so that he can participate with me in creating video content and what we're releasing and what we're doing and being involved with us. Um, we certainly, uh, take them with it. Matter of fact, first time I met Larry, my oldest son Ezekiel uh, flew out there with me. That was his first uh, plane flight uh, to go on a trip with me, uh, which was cool. But uh, we we go at a different intensity level with a lot of things. We Angela and I both are entrepreneurs, so we both are running businesses. Our kids are involved in all of those things that we're a part of and are doing. And we simply the stuff that you heard me talk today um, is what we train our children in. It's what we have our family being trained in. I'm only teaching this kind of stuff because it's what we've walked in and what we've lived. Uh, and um, it's even challenging for us at this point. This year for homeschooling was the first time we've actually bought set curriculum because we've, um, in the past, we just didn't have the finances to afford to buy any. But we also discovered there's an enormous amount of quality stuff available online that um, is at no cost. And so we've utilized a lot of that, although it took a lot of focus and energy from my wife primarily that compiled all of that. We we're at a place where she couldn't, um, she didn't have that availability to do that. So we bought some uh, curriculum, we researched and found and thought we were going to really enjoy, 
But our challenge at this point is, is most anything that is from a Christian curriculum format, we cannot, <laughs> we, everything I taught today was diametrically opposed to everything that we have in this, in Christian um, curriculum for our children. And so we bought these things and then we're going through them. And every day I feel like I'm having to, I'm having to rearrange what's being said or communicated through those. Uh, so I need someone to help me write and build some kind of uh, homeschooling curriculum. Uh, Sunday school children's ministry curriculum needs to be created in these kinds of revelation. And so that's probably, we're just taking some bold steps uh, in that regard to say that we're not uh, going to just continue to go along with things that we don't, we don't see that are accurate uh, from the heartbeat of father. So I don't know if that answers anything or not. I'll unmute and listen to you. You know, one thing I think that does Eric for me is, it reflects back on the fact that one of the freedoms that you're going to gain, and one of the first freedom anybody's going to gain from a different mindset, that includes the goodness of God already being manifest, is a freedom to experiment and try things, even if you're wrong. Yes. Even if you're wrong. Because you're not going to get punished. It's not production-based. And the, the thing that greets you at the end of the day is not a whip. Whether that whip's hanging on the wall dormant or in the hands of a taskmaster, it's just not a whip-based society right. anymore. It's a love-based yeah. society. Yeah, you have goodness and mercy. All right, one, one last one, then we're going to make a break. Hey, Eric, Sonny, thanks hey, for Sonny. responding to me on Facebook the other day. Oh, so, okay. Uh, um, I was sitting there trying to formulate a question, but what drives you inside to go ahead with, like, bold things? Is it... Are things drawing up within you like you're feeling when a person feels stuck or not necessarily stuck, but maybe kind of flat and there's something inside that's kind of, it's not coming up yet, but uh, you feel like you need to jump ahead. And do you feel like that's a driving force in you or because this message is allowing you to engage in the stuff inside or I guess basically how are you driven are you driven by that sense or what if does that make any sense yeah let me now answer you um yeah a uh, great question thanks man and, and and you're right there um everyone there's motivation for all of us in all kinds of ways but uh, in particular for me um, I, I'm, I'm motivated out of a very deep heart of compassion and a very deep heart of love. I really, really, really believe in people. I really believe in the potential and the capacity that they have within them. And I guess in a lot of ways, even what you heard me communicating this morning and what's in my books is, is that there has been so much teaching that is actually uh, demoralizing uh, and reducing and restricting the pursuit of potential, which was a major reason why I shifted eschologically as well over 15 years ago, because I was not going to live in a, uh, in a system that spoke that the future has nothing worth going for and going after because it was just in an, an inevitable collapse. Um, and so uh, those things uh, I'm very deeply driven uh, by also what I, uh, even in my coaching, my personal development coaching, um, uh, program, the first place that we start with is on clarity and awareness because clarity is your power. The more clear you are on who you are, why you are, how you're going to do life and what you're going to produce with your life, you will accomplish at higher measures and your potential will be actualized at, um, at further degrees. And so I've got very clear, increasingly clear on who I am and why I am because I'm living based on who and why instead of how and what. And that's that's my second module of my coaching program uh, specifically, walks people through those four areas to discover for your life, for your family, for your business and your ministry. Because when you get clear on who you are you and why you are, the how and the what will naturally come. And I'm very driven to unlock humanity 
and the potential of who they are. So uh, the it's a I suppose in that when you encounter the heart of Father, you're infused with it in such a way that your passion becomes like a father almost for anybody and everybody in the sense of, I want to give towards you in ways that cause you to flourish because that's the heartbeat of any father, right? You want your children to, to excel and become everything that you see within them that they can be. And my passion at that level is like that with humanity at large. And so uh, I'm giving myself fully to contribute what I can uh, and to make an impact in a way in the world that says, to every individual, no matter what state you're in, no matter what race, what gender, what background, what's your situation, whether trapped in addiction or living at the, uh, in some high class situation as a CEO, there is something of even further glory within you that can be tapped into, developed and unlocked so that the world experiences a brighter future, God's honored and others benefit. And so I'm just driven by that. And I, I've always been a driven person uh, because I want to release everything that's within me. And, and honestly, um, well, not that everything else wasn't honest, <laughs> but um, to say that uh, what I encounter, I had a very difficult situation through my mid uh, to later thirties, where if you saw my Facebook live last night, I communicated a lot uh, about the loss that we occurred uh, being in a place of being homeless with four children, uh, three children at that point, uh, for a while was extremely devastating, uh, high levels of rejection, high levels uh, of a lot of loss and a lot of tailspin and a lot of disappointment, a lot of disillusionment, a lot of um, loss in ways that really trapped me. And when God said to me in 2014 into 2013, he said, I want you to carry the revelation of hope in the earth. And my first response to him was, no, thank you. I said, please don't make me do that. I, I, I literally said back to him, I'm not a Hallmark card. I don't want to be Guy Smiley. I'm not a little cheerleader that wants to go around. Uh, I got a hard, hard metal, hardcore metal background. I wasn't looking to be, uh, if you will, a Hallmark card with little bunny foo-foo and a nice little mountain and stream. That is just not who I am, right? That, that crunchy part of me, Larry, was like, uh -uh, don't make me do this. Uh, and so... Um, his response back to me at that point was, as he said, it's because you don't know what hope is. So that got my attention pretty quick. And then out of that, all that we've discussed today has developed out of that. And because of what we, because of what I now live in and what the experience is of our family, both relationally in our marriage, parenting with our children, the atmosphere of our home, uh, the development of our businesses, the financial outcome uh, and increase in development with our influence and our impact as it continuing to broaden and expand the outflow of that, even without the production part, but this part in here and this part in here for me is the, is the experience that drives me because I know how deep I had sunk in my own heart. As a, as a son, as a, a, a highly and passion Christian for my entire lifetime, I knew what it felt like to be trapped. And so it's the freedom that I've encountered out of that because of the present reality of hope that absolutely drives me to unlock as many people as possible. So maybe I'll end with that and I can hear your responses. So go for it. Yeah, so kind of what I'm hearing from myself is this message is pulling us out of striving with the striving of a fallen Adam and working on our lives out of the freedom of the spirit. So uh, thank you for that. That's good, man. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so we're going to take a, a 